Okay, good morning. I guess you can hear me fine. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I would like to talk about effects. Right? If you are a Scala programmer or if you are new to Scala as well, you have probably heard something about the way you can manage effects in Scala. The fact that in Scala we have a couple of possibilities in which you can tame side effects. So I would like to consider you know, the basics first, like what is an effect? What is an effect system? Why would you want to use an effect system in the first place? And of course there's also the question which of the effect systems out there is the best. Uh, but I will try to avoid answering that one. It's almost like a personal question, so you will have to answer it for yourself. Um, so yeah, so let's start with the problem statement, right? So here we see an evolution of a method signature from an untyped version to, to a typed one. And we will actually start with static types before we get into, into, uh, into effects. Our uh, running example will be some aliens trying to get, trying to build a rocket to get home. So we, you will see some code, not a lot of it, but some of it. Um, so here we have added some static types to our signature. And I think we have either learned or discovered over the years that this operation of evolving a signature to actually have some types is beneficial, right? It is some more work to do, because you have not only to get the syntax right, but you also have to satisfy the compiler uh, so that the types match, right? So, uh, so there are some constraints that we have added for ourselves, right? We now also have to add these static types. But these constraints uh, usually, usually pay off. That's why we do, that, that's why we add those static types, right? So we add some structure to code, we add some constraints to get some benefits. And there's a number of benefits that you might get from static types, right? Um, maybe not all of these resonate with you. Maybe you are after only some of them, right? Maybe you like static types because they provide documentation for the reader of the code. Maybe you like static types because of the IDE completions you get. Uh, maybe you like them because you get automatic verification of some properties uh, of your code. Right? The compiler can verify it for you, so you don't have to write all those tests that, that you would in a dynamic language. Uh, maybe you like static types because you like to refactor with confidence. Right? It helps you to refactor things and so on. Maybe you get some compile time optimizations. Uh, maybe you like them because you can generate code using implicits. Right? Implicits uh, are a mechanism for generating new terms basing on types. So there's a lot of reasons why you might like static types, why we might accept the necessity to add some structure and to add some constraints to the code we write. And we have discovered this not only in Scala, but also other languages, like in the evolution of JavaScript to TypeScript and the popularity of TypeScript, I think is a, a very nice case in point that as far as large code bases go and enterprise code bases and or code bases which have to be maintained by large teams over a long period of time. So in these contexts, I think static typing won against, against dynamic typing, right? Of course, there are some situations where dynamic typing is more convenient, maybe scripts or smaller, uh, smaller deployments. But overall, like, I think the whole industry kind of agrees that static types are a good thing and, uh, and that they are actually beneficial. There are also, of course, some disadvantages to static typing, but uh, I won't show them here. They, won't, they, they wouldn't fit the narrative. Um, so yeah, so what's, uh, how, how does this tie in with effects, right? So now we can start to wonder, can we extend the same approach of adding more structure and adding some more constraints so that we can tame effects, right? An effect is, um, describes how running a function impacts its environment, and we will talk a bit more about it later as well. So the question is now, if we add this more structure to manage effects, will the benefits still outweigh the costs, right? So maybe, may, 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 maybe they don't, and it doesn't make sense, or maybe it does, then we should do it. Um, in Scala, we have a couple of possibilities, and maybe too many, in fact, right? Uh, we can use futures to manage side effects. 
uh, may be extended by ACA or maybe not nowadays. Um, we can use a cuts effect to manage, uh, to manage effects in a functional way. We can use Zio to manage effects in a functional way. There's also, uh, pro uh, there's also Project Loom, which brings new capabilities to the JVM platform. So maybe this also ties in somehow with effect management. Uh, there's the research project uh, that's happening at, at, at EPFL to introduce capabilities to Scala 3, which also, at its, as its goal, has side effect management. So uh, maybe we will get some new answers to this question. But uh, so far, there is no good single answer yet. So we still have to come up with it. So you might wonder, why is this so hard, right? Why do we have to make all these hard choices, ACA, Cuts Effect, Zio, Loom, capabilities, and so on? And I think that's because it is still kind of a research problem, right? We haven't even settled on the type of static typing that is good, like, let's say, for general business enterprise programming, right? Let alone how we should manage static types. So it is a research problem, which we all participate in, and where we can all provide some input. It's not only like an academic research problem, but a very practical one. Um, but by studying it and by picking your favorite, I think you can help settle what is, the, what is the answer here. So let's look at the definition of what an effect is before we dive any further. So if we go to Wikipedia, it's like kind of a first re reflex we might have when, uh, when uh, trying to define something. We can see that a function has a side effect if it has an observable effect other than returning a value to the caller. So, okay, that definition is okay-ish, let's say. One problem I have with it is that it's kind of recursive because it says that the function has a side effect if it has an effect. So an effect is not defined in Wikipedia, so that's not the best definition, I guess. So I have changed it a bit. I would say that a function has a side effect if apart from returning a value, which is like the main purpose of having a function, right? It changes some observable behavior of the system. And the observable aspect here is important, right? It might be possible that when we call a method or a function in Scala, it actually changes some registers in the CPU. And uh, however, the other parts of our system, the other parts of our Scala code will never notice that, right? It's abstracted away. So we are not concerned with such changes. We, can, we are only concerned with changes which we can actually see from other parts in the code, right? Um, another important thing is that this is contextual. Uh, we are probably not concerned with tracking or with uh, monitoring, uh, for example, memory usage, right? Maybe the function which we call allocates a lot of memory. And because we have called this function, uh, at some point later in time, we will get an out-of-memory exception, right? We wouldn't say that it is a side effect because we are not really concerned with tracking how much memory is consumed. Uh, maybe logging as well, right? This, also, this is always a controversial uh, subject. Should logging be considered an effect, right? Uh, some people are very dogmatic here and say, of course, right? It writes to a file and so on. Some people are more practical and say, well, not really. Right? It's not something that you, are, you want to be concerned with, not something that is that important. Uh, if the logging system is well written and if it doesn't throw exceptions out of the blue, we, sh we, we should be fine. So uh, we can consider uh, logging as an effect or not depending on the context in which we are in. So it's not, it's, it's not a very clear cut uh, thing. Um, one thing I uh, would like also to mention is I'm not sure if side effect is the best name. Um, side effect comes from medicine, right? If uh, we take some substance and if it has some unwanted or undesirable effects on our body, then we say the side effect of that medicine. And that's where the term comes from. Um, but that's not true when programming, right? When we call a method which has effects, we are calling it because it has these effects. So these are not undesirable or unwanted uh, effects. So th these are not side effects. That's the whole purpose of the method being called, right? If a method has side effects, that's a bug, not, 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 not a feature. So I will just say effect going on. So some examples of effects, right? Uh, the simplest one, uh, ri writing a global variable is quite obvious. If we write a global va variable in a method, uh, other parts of our system might be affected, 
right? So we may see some observable changes in the behavior of other parts of our system. So the sole fact of calling a method which writes a global variable changes something in the overall system behavior. Exceptions, also a very good example of a side effect, of an effect, sorry, I should uh, use my own terminology correctly. So and, uh, and if a method throws an exception, it changes the way the rest of the code behaves, right? We jump out of the call side to the exception handler, or maybe we jump out uh, from the calling method entirely. So this is clearly an effect uh, that is different from just returning a value, right? In fact, we don't get a return value. Uh, I/O also an, an effect, it might throw an exception, uh, which al already kind of uh, satisfies uh, the definition, but it also might allocate some scarce resources, right? I said before that we are not concerned probably with uh, monitoring how much memory we use, which is also a scarce resource, but we might be more concerned with other resources such as file descriptors or the network bandwidth or, and so on and so on. Um, now, there are some controversial ones, right, which might or might not be an effect. So starting a thread, it might be an implementation detail. So if, an, if a method uh, starts five threads to speed up a computation and then joins them and just gets the results, um, right, it just runs faster from, from the observer's point of view. Um, there are no, uh, if the threads have no effects, the entire method has no effects as well. So starting a thread doesn't have to automatically mean a method has, has effects, right? Sleeping, if the sleeping is interruptible, if it can throw an exception, then yes, uh, it, it is an effect, of course. Otherwise, if it's un uninterruptible, well, probably like it just takes a longer time, right? It's not it's something we can distinguish uh, from just a long computation, computing the next digit of pi or the last digit of pi or, or whatever. Uh, so sleep doesn't have to be an effect as well. And finally, reading a global variable is not an effect under this definition, right? Because if we read something from the global environment, it doesn't change the observable, beh the observable behavior of the rest of the system, right? So writing a global variable, yes, but reading is not an effect. And there's an important distinction that if a method is effect-free, it's not yet enough for the method or for the function to be pure. Uh, pure meaning that it is a mathematical function where the output depends only on the inputs, right? So a pure mathematical function rules out reading from a global variable, why effect-free doesn't, right? If we have an effect-free method, which in addition is idempotent, so which in ad addition um, only where the output only depends on the inputs and we can call it multiple times, then we get a pure method. So these are two different things effect-free is not as strong as being pure. Okay, so now that we know what an effect system is, uh, what an effect is, what is an effect system, right? We can again uh, go to Wikipedia for the definition and see that an effect system is a formal system that describes effects of programs. Again, I, the definition is okay-ish. Uh, I, I actually like the definition I found in Unison Docs. Unison is a functional programming language which is written by some people you might know from the Scala community, uh, and they define an effect system as guardrails uh, which help you in expressing your program logics involving effects, right? So there are some constraints, there's some more structure that we add to our code to help manage these effects. So now that we know what an effect system is, why would we want to use one, right? We need some motivation to actually see why would this be a good idea. As a motivating example, one of many motivating examples, let's consider remote procedure calls, right? It has been a temptation in many languages to actually make RPC calls look and behave the same as local calls, right? It seems like a nice attraction. We will just pretend the network is not there and we will, call, we, we will hide all the complexities in, uh, behind a nice method call. However, it turns out that it usually fails uh, so this, the, these attempts to, to make this, uh, these, this abstraction fail because RPC calls don't behave the same as local calls, right? You have latency, which can be un un unpredictable. You have a lot of different failure modes. Uh, the, an RPC uh, call might fail, and then it might succeed, and then it might fail out of the blue without any good reason, right? Uh, it might time out. 
Uh, and if it times out, you don't really know if it completed, you just didn't get the answer, or maybe it was never sent. So uh, these RPC calls are fundamentally different from a local call, right? And trying to emulate synchronous method dispatch over a network is just an invitation for, for bugs. So maybe we need some way to manage these failure modes uh, to actually uh, implement RPC correctly. And there's, a, again, a number of reasons why you might want to use an effect system in your code, right? Maybe you're just the type who just wants to know. Maybe you just want to know that a method actually has some effects, and you just, you know, when you look at a method, you want to know that if it's pure, if it's effect-free, or if it's effect-full, right? So that's one reason. Maybe you want, uh, maybe you're after performance, and you want to use asynchronous I.O., but you don't want to use all those callbacks and so on. So you want some saner way to work with, uh, with asynchronous I.O. And to do that, you need some kind of framework, some kind of guardrails, uh, which will help you in expressing your code uh, using async I.O. So you probably need some kind of custom runtime, which also maybe uh, provides support for uh, interruptions. Uh, maybe it uh, sub, uh, provides support for some context propagation and so on. So you might need this custom runtime to actually manage those effects in, uh, in, your, in your system. Maybe you want even more freedom in, in, in refactoring, right? If, uh, if you're using a functional effect system, uh, they usually give you what's called referential transparency, which allows you to use simple refactorings, such as extract common code or introduce variable, um, and you can use those refactorings without uh, the fear that this will change the semantics or the ordering of effects in your code. So that's another reason why you might want to use an effect system. Finally, maybe you want to manage all those failure modes we've been talking about, right? These are I.O. effects, but, these are also uh, but there's also resource management, uh, meaning that you maybe you want to ensure that some resource is safely allocated after being used. Maybe you want an API for declarative concurrency, right? Maybe you don't want to use locks, semaphores, shared memory, and so on, because again, that's very error prone. You can get deadlocks, you can get race conditions. So maybe, uh, and these are usually effectful computations. So maybe you want some kind of API which allows you to, uh, to perform concurrency in a declarative way. So the, these are all the uh, reasons why we might use an effect system. But how are we going to do that? Well, usually it ends up being an extension of the type system, right? We add something to the, to the type system which allows us uh, to uh, add those guardrails to the, uh, for, the, for the effects that we want to express. And here, Scala is a particularly good language for adding such guardrails uh, because it's very concise, so we don't get if we, even if we implement a custom runtime, we don't get a lot of syntax noise. I think in Scala, it is at all possible to implement custom runtimes for effect systems, comparing, for example, to Java, where this would mean so much boilerplate and so much syntactic noise that it might not be usable. So Scala here really has an edge because of its, uh, be, well, first because it's a functional language. Secondly, because it has an advanced type system which actually allows you to do these extensions and allows you to implement those constraints inside the type system. So we will evaluate a couple of effect systems and we will look at some of their characteristics. So we will uh, take a look at things like syntax overhead, which is important for many people. Uh, many people want to use syntax that is as close to the host language as possible, so we will see if, if that's possible in our effect systems. We will see if uh, it's possible to use custom control structures, uh, how, uh, how if, if, if there are any APIs to manage concurrency, if the effect system provides referential transparency, meaning you can extract, you, you, you can uh, represent programs as values. Uh, we'll see what kind of runtime an effect system uses. We'll see uh, how precise the effect systems are, right? So if we look at the, uh, the source code, do we really know where the effects happen? Okay, and let's actually start with checked exceptions, which are an effect system where they are baked into, into Java. Uh, as we have uh, defined before, 
An exception, a checked exception, uh, is an effect, right? So checked exceptions provide these guardrails which allow you to manage which exceptions are thrown and which are not, right? So they satisfy the definition of an effect system. So here we have a method um, which is written in a kind of a Scala Java hybrid. It's uh, because of the throws up there. I, I think it's almost valid Scala 3 code uh, with, the, with the capabilities, uh, capabilities extension. But let's pretend for now that uh, such a language exists and that Scala has uh, checked exceptions. So in the method here, what we are doing is uh, we are trying to assemble a rocket for our passengers, right? So first what we do is we fetch the passengers list, right? We can, so that, that we know how many passengers we have. Uh, we, depending on the number of passengers and their weight, uh, then we have to uh, calculate the launch parameters, giving some destination coordinates. If we have to fly far away, we need to attach some additional booster rockets. Finally, when this is done, we can, in parallel, fuel up all the rocket stages, all the booster rockets and the rocket stages, and then we can launch. Okay, so that's the, what the code does. Um, so now let's look at some of the characteristics that we have defined before. Right, so first we have occurrence precision. So looking at the code, we can see that it has some side effects, right? It has side effects because we have the throws clause, which tells us that some side effects happen. If we have a throws IO exception, we know it, uh, there's some interaction uh, with, uh, with the network or with the file system, right? So this is like the marker that an effect happens in this effect system. Um, however, if we look at the code, we don't really know which methods throw exceptions, right? Is it fetch passengers? that might throw an exception? Is it propel launch? Is it attach booster rockets? So uh, this system is, has, low occurrence, uh, has low occurrence precision. But it also has a low syntax overhead, right? We are just using plain Scala Java hybrid, right? It is type safe. There's no referential transparency here. No um, checked exceptions don't provide any kind of concurrency API. However, we can use built-in con control structures um, you might be surprised that there's only some failure management, and of course we can you know, catch exceptions, uh, but there's very limited support for timeouts. Uh, there's some support for, re for resource safety, but not also, uh, it's not complete. There's some support for interruptions in uh, Java, but it's also spotted because we, you can catch the interruption and just forget about it. So there is some failure management, but it's not like complete and polished. So I think what's very interesting about checked exceptions is that they're a failed system. If you ask a random Java programmer out there, uh, they will probably say that they would prefer to have only unchecked exceptions, right? And I think it's interesting to study why this effect system failed, right? Because if we are trying to build an effect system, uh, we have a failure, right? So we can learn from it and build something better. Uh, so why did, check why did checked exceptions fail? That's a very good question, right? Uh, I suspect it's a subset of the reasons I have enumerated here, or maybe there are some, uh, maybe there are some other ones. These are the ones like I found most commonly uh, reading through Stack Overflow and the web. So some of the reasons, uh, maybe there's no polymorphism, which makes using uh, lambdas which uh, where the code in the lambda throws exceptions very hard, right? You either have to decide that uh, the, the, the lambda throws exceptions, so it can throw an exception, or that it uh, doesn't throw an exception in which you have to handle all the error cases. So the lack of polymorphism makes it really hard to work with high order functions in, in Java. Um, maybe it's because uh, checked exceptions are too specific. It's too easy to create your own checked exception, which has to be handled by the caller, right? Maybe it is the fact that they, that they always can be eliminated, so we can always catch an exception and just forget about it, right? Uh, which is also uh, how people often misuse uh, checked exceptions, right? It's not the way you should handle exceptions, just catching them and throwing them away. So it's too easy to misuse them, right? It's also there are no clear-cut guidelines when to use a checked exception and when to use a, a runtime one. From what I found, people tend to have some opinions on it saying, for example, that 
you should use a checked exception if the error condition is outside of your control and outside of the API's control, right? So an I.O. exception is a good example because you can't really control when an I.O. An, an error will happen. Um, an illegal argument is a good example of a runtime exception because it's under the client's control and it's up to the client to provide correct parameters. Um, also, exceptions have a very high signal-to-nose ratio, meaning that uh, they have a lot of syntax overhead in actually dealing with the exceptions, especially when you have to translate unchecked to uh, checked to unchecked and so on. So uh, these are some of the reasons why the system failed, and using them, knowing them, we might look for something better. So now let's examine another example. I guess you will see Zio quite a lot throughout uh, the conference. Uh, in Zio, we represent, and in a functional effect system, we represent computations as values. So each, each, computation ends up, each computation which is effectful ends up as a description of a value which is lazily evaluated. Uh, so this, th this way we do get referential transparency, we do, we do get the refactoring capabilities. Uh, however, to sequence to computations, so to sequence to effectful computations, we can no longer just enumerate them one after another, we have to use things like a flat map, right, which gives us a much higher syntax overhead that we have to use. So here in our example, uh, we, have the, we, we, we can see that fetch passengers actually is an effectful method, right? So we have high occurrence precision. We can see exactly which of these, eff, uh, we, which of these method calls are effectful, uh, because uh, to use them, we have to use things like a flat map, not just assign uh, the results to a value, right? So the precision here is high. So we have to fetch the passengers, which is effectful. Then we prepare lunch, and we can see that this is now a normal method, which just computes its results based on the parameters, right? Nothing effectful. And then we can define uh, the other computations that need to take place. When we define them, they don't take place yet. It's just a description, right? So we define a computation to attach the booster rockets. We define a computation to fuel up all the stages, and we can use the custom control structure provided by Zio, which is a parallel for each to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to fuel the, them up uh, concurrently. Uh, actually, here, with the exception code, we had to do it by hand, right? And also what uh, I forgot to mention is that this code with the executor, it has a bug because it doesn't handle error cases, um, which is a problem. Uh, in uh, general in concurrent programming in Java, but this is solved by uh, functional effect systems such as Zio. We just use the custom control structure. And once we have these descriptions, we can sequence them, right? So the, the star beak operator, however you call it, uh, it's just a, short, it's a shorthand for a flat map. So it says we first do attach, then we do a fuel, and then we press the button to launch. So in the end, we have the sequencing of the computation defined. Um, so yeah, so we have uh, high occurrence precision, we have, the tr we have, transparent, we have referential transparency. Uh, however, we have high syntax overhead, as I mentioned, um, which some people don't really like. Uh, so it's not perfect, at least yet. So then we can uh, compare this to Katz effect, which is almost the same. There are some syntactical differences. But for the purposes of this example, the evaluation here is, exact, is, is the same. Of course, the type is different because in Zio, we also get to track the type of the error that might happen precisely. So here it's just a general exception, but it might be something more specific. In cats, the error is always assumed to be exception. Um, so we have always to be ready to handle exceptions. In Zio, we have to be, to be ready only to handle the defined error cases, but otherwise this is exactly the same. However, cats uh, also allow us to use uh, async await syntax, which is also interesting, because the aim here is to decrease the syntax overhead, right? So the main problems here that we have identified is, for example, the syntax overhead, and that we can't use the built-in control structures. Um, so async await tries to fix that in a way, right? So we can wrap our whole method inside an async block. And inside that async block, we can use .await, which uh, kind of unwraps 
the I.O. computation and allows us to assign the result to a value. So when, uh, upon compilation, this async will be translated by the compiler to something similar like this, right? Uh, but we can write it in a more direct style, uh, just forcing computations using await. So it is still functional under the hood, but the syntax we, we use to define the, the, the method is different. So uh, we can still use the I.O. syntax, we can use still flat maps, but we also have the option to use the async await variant, which we know from other languages and ecosystems as well. So here the syntax overhead, let's say, is, is a medium, right? However, by using await, we also lose re referential transparency, right? Because the ordering of effects here depends on the ordering of the definition. So with a, functional, with a fully functional effect system, the, uh, the ordering of effects is decoupled from the, uh, the, the, the definition of effects, right? So here we first define uh, various uh, effective, uh, effectful computations, and then we sequence them using these star beaks, right? Here, we don't have this separation. So we use referential transparency unless we use I.O. So it's like a mixed, uh, mixed result. Um, we also can use some control structures that are in Scala. So we can use an if uh, statement. We can use a while loop, but we cannot use a for loop, for example. So this will be a compilation error. So again, this is mixed, uh, so yellow towards red, because there's not really that much custom controls, uh, built-in con control structures which we can use. So for completeness, let's also look at future, right? Future, it maybe looks similar. There's also flat maps, uh, but uh, we don't, uh, but the future is fundamentally different in the the way it's working because it represents a running computation. So the moment we define a future, the computation starts, right? So we don't also have referential transparency. Uh, the computations take order in the place, the effects take order in the place, uh, in the order in which they are mentioned in the source code. Uh, we also have to be careful not to define the computations too far. So the important thing here is that the attach and fuel things, they are not vals anymore. So here they've been vals, right? These, these are values. And here, these are methods. So we have to ensure that these are lazily uh, evaluated because we sequence these things at the end, right? We first want to attach, then we want, we want to fuel up, and then we want to press the button, right? So the, we need to make sure that they are only evaluated on demand so lazily. So we have to manage this laziness by ourselves. Um, so yeah, so the evaluation here isn't, isn't uh, that good. We do get high occurrence precision because we see where the effects happen because of the flat maps, but we don't get any of the other goodies. So um, I would also like to uh, go ahead a bit and see what we can get in Scala in the future. But to do that, I would like to evaluate also another effect system from Unison, which I, which I already mentioned. Unison uses algebraic effects, which are a promising approach to to managing effects. So uh, in unison, it's like okay, Haskell, maybe kind syntax. Um, you have uh, the go home method or the function, which returns a, a unit, so nothing uh, interesting. But it also, uh, uh, when, uh, when evaluating the go home function, also IO effects might happen, uh, which are uh, specified by the IO marker in the curly braces. Right? Um, what is important here is that the I.O. effect is a property of a function, not of, not of, a, re, of a return value. So we, can, we can't really have a computation which uh, describes an effectful, uh, we can't really have a value which describes an effectful computation, right? We can only have uh, these effects being properties of functions. So what they did is they added this quoting, which is the apostrophe, the single quotation mark up there, and it says that, in fact, what we, re what we return here is a function from unit to unit, okay? So this, this quotation mark is a syntax sugar for just writing a thunk, uh, unit to unit function, right? And this function, when evaluating this function, we can expect I.O. effects uh, to happen. 
So we need to, so again, this is manual management of the laziness that we need to, to perform here. Uh, because uh, this uh, laziness is, is managed manually, we also have to force, we, 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 we need a way to force computations, and we can see it over there with the bank operator. So uh, we have fetch passengers, which we know is an effectful computation, and we need to force it using the bank, so we need to apply it to a unit parameter so that the effects actually take, take place. And it's the same with attaching the booster rockets. Uh, then we have uh, a way to concurrently, uh, to concurrently fuel up the stages. So here we have to, uh, first we define a list, of, um, a list of computations, a list of lazily evaluated computations which, where each computation fuels up a single stage. So we have to manually quote. Again, here we have the quote fuel up, right? So this creates a thunk. This creates a function taking a unit parameter and uh, returning whatever the fuel up does. So we have to manually quote. So we prepare a list of computation descriptions, very similar to a function effect system. And then we can, we can run them in, in the threads and join these threads. So how do we evaluate such a system? So the occurrence precision here is really mixed, right? Because, well, we have the, those banks operators, which uh, kind of tell us that effects happen there. However, if there's a method which takes some parameters and has some effects, we wouldn't see it in, in the syntax because we would no longer need the quoting mechanism because this would already be a function, right? We only need the quoting for when we want to represent a, a computation as a value. If we have a function, if, for example, fetch passengers was taking some parameters, we wouldn't need to use the bank operator anymore. So the occurrence precision here is mixed, right? The syntax overhead uh, also medium because uh, we need those quotation marks and those bank operators. And managing that in practice is a bit troublesome and it, it, it is a bit tricky to get it right. We don't get reflection transparency because the effects happen in the order they are defined over here, so we cannot just extract a value, and this might change the ordering of effects. Um, but we can use the control structures that are built in the language, right? Um, we have some concurrency tools. Unison is a young language that is still evolving, so it's not like Mm, it's not like, uh, it's not what we get in Zio, for example, but they are getting there. So, um, why, I, why, why am I mentioning this? Um, that's because uh, the future Scala versions, uh, Scala 3 or whatever comes after Scala 3, might also see an implementation of algebraic effects. The Caprese program that's in, at EPFL, as far as I know, uh, as one of its points, has, uh, has studying um, how um, algebraic effects can be brought into Scala and implemented in Scala, right? So here we can have a completely imaginative implementation of how this might look in practice. So we have the IO of unit, which is the effect marker, and that is a context function, meaning it's a shorthand for writing a function which requires some kind of an IO marker implicit value and returns a unit. So fetch passengers would be such a function, and it, we don't see it here, but in fact, to invoke fetch passengers, we need to have the implicit I.O. marker in scope, right? And to have this in scope, well, we either have to provide the implicit value, or we have to define the go-home method to, to, uh, to be the context function itself. So um, the downside here, the downside of context functions, it, that they have pure, uh, that, they, that they have poor uh, type inference. So the the idea or the compiler won't actually suggest you, you know, fetch passengers is effectful. It uh, needs the I/O marker as an implicit value. You need to make go home um, effectful as well, right? So you have to do it by hand yourself. So the type inference here is quite poor. Also, the occurrence precision in such a system is poor as well. The same with the exceptions. We don't really know over here which of these methods are effectful, right? They all look the same, as, uh, as, 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 if, they were, as if they were not effectful. Uh, however, the syntax overhead is quite low, right? We, we, can, we, we, can, we can just use plain old, uh, plain old Scala. We don't get referential transparency, uh, just as with exceptions and, and, and as the other uh, systems. 
uh, with uh, Loom, which provides us with virtual threads, and which might allow us to get the benefits of uh, asynchronous I.O. Um, using direct style. Uh, we probably can implement some kind of API. So here, the lib is, is some concurrency library built on top of Loom, which provides things like run all. Uh, but as you can see, uh, here we need to uh, also manually uh, provide, uh, we have to manually man manage laziness, right? So if we have the imaginative run all method, it probably will need a list of computations which should be run uh, concurrently, which should be run in parallel, right? So here we define a, a list of tanks, again, of lazily evaluated uh, fuel up uh, stage, uh, fuel up functions. So again, as in, a, as in a unison, for these concurrency methods, we will probably need to manually manage the laziness and to manually provide um, these computations in their lazy form. Um, so uh, in, in the functional effect systems, that's out of the box, right? Everything is lazy, which has its upsides because it's very uniform, but it also has its downsides because, well, everything is lazy always, and you can't do anything about it. So the question is, can we get a perfect effect system, right? Can we get an effect system which has high occurrence precision, which provides referential transparency, and which has low syntax overhead? So you might wonder, you know, maybe it's a two out of three. We love those two out of three theorems. But it seems it's more like one, of, one out of three in some cases, right? We can get referential transparency and high occurrence, pre and high occurrence precision at the cost of high syntax overhead in a functional effect system, right? We can get high occurrence precision and low syntax overhead, kind of, not maybe fully, in systems like in uh, Unison. But it also seems that syntax overhead, uh, low syntax overhead, and having referential transparency is at odds, so we can't have these two together. At least, maybe it's not yet discovered, so maybe it is possible. So, you know, uh, it is really up to you to decide. There are some questions that you have to answer yourself. You know, how important is the lack of syntax overhead for you, right? Are you ready to use flat maps and so on? Um, also, it's a question for all of us. What can we learn from checked exceptions? Why did the system fail? Why do so many people say that it's, it's a bad system and that we, it shouldn't be in Java in the first place? So how can we design something better? Um, also, how representing computations as values fits your programming style, right? Is it something that you would like to do on a regular basis? Do you want every effectful computation to be represented as a value? Are you fine with that? Or not, right? So this also might bring you closer to the answer which effect system is for you. And finally, do you want to use the core J JVM runtime? So do you want to use, uh, for example, virtual threads uh, uh, as, uh, as the JVM provides them? Or are you fine with using a custom runtime which gives you some additional capabilities? However, it is some kind of uh, addition to the JVM. So these are the questions that you have to answer yourself. So at the end, I would also like to mention my company. If uh, you, know, if you have uh, any kind of business problem and you would like to flesh it out in technical terms, please come and talk to us. Or if you have a technical problem in any of the technologies in which we specialize, and that's uh, quite a lot more than Scala, please uh, come to us as well. Uh, I'm here at uh, the conference uh, today and tomorrow, of course. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm also on Mastodon, because you never know when Twitter is going to stop working. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, thank you very much.